Excellent. Well, hello. Good morning, everybody. Uh, if, if uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, as I was saying, I, I'm an application engineer at MathWorks. Please remember to mute your mute your phone, mute your your line. I'm I'm hearing a lot of background noise. Thank you. Um, so, as uh, it is probably very uh, familiar to all of you, battery systems are extremely important uh, nowadays, and um, the uh, the most popular type of uh, of battery systems, those are based on uh, lithium ion batteries in modern technology, uh, have a very high energy and, and power density. They perform very well. Um, However, it is extremely important that we keep the, the battery system um, very, very um, within tight um, tolerances in terms of operating uh, conditions and environmental conditions as well. So that's uh, one of the reasons why it is so important to count on a good design and good models for design uh, battery systems. Things that we are going to share with you uh, today include the way in which um, battery um, performance depends on temperature. It is uh, probably quite familiar to all of you that uh, the um, when uh, when your cell phone, for example, is uh, in a in a cold temperature, um, it uh, it responds uh, slower than it would at uh, room temperature, and it's also uh, the case that because the internal resistance of the battery cell in the in the device, cell phone or 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 car or whatever it may be, uh, that has important performance uh, consequences and uh, to, to, to an extent that a, an electric vehicle has a range reduced by an amount close to 20% in the middle of a very cold winter. So that's one thing that uh, the battery engineer needs to contemplate very, very uh, carefully. And uh, the models that we are going to share with you today are, are going to show the way in which you can uh, contemplate the thermal behavior or the thermal dependencies of the battery on the um, with um, with the equivalent circuit approach. The second thing that I am going to be talking about today is state of charge or SOC. State of charge is a uh, a relative measure of the amount of energy that is inside the cell. It's a number between zero and one. One meaning that the cell is fully charged, zero that is fully discharged. And it is extremely important because it tells me how much uh, longer I am going to be able to use my, um, my battery powered device. In, in the case of a cell phone, how much, uh, how much longer I'm going to be able to talk. Uh, in the case of a laptop, how much longer I'm going to be able to, to work with the laptop. And in the case of uh, an electric vehicle, uh, the remaining range, which is extremely important, as you as you know, because uh, not knowing the the range in an electric vehicle causes what's called uh, uh, um, range anxiety, right? So, it is extremely important to determine the state of charge uh, accurately. However, there is a problem with that, and it is that the state of charge of the battery cannot be measured directly. I, I cannot look inside a, a battery cell and, and see the, the, the state of charge as I, I could see, for example, the amount of water inside a bucket, right? In the case of the state of charge, what I do is measure some other things like voltage, current, and temperature, and so on. And using fairly complex algorithms, I determine the state of charge using a model of the cell. And last but not least, it is a very well established fact that the battery degrades over time. And this is due to multiple causes and it includes cycling. So because of the use of the battery and also aging because of just calendar life. That is to say, the battery starts degrading the second it leaves the, the factory, right? And uh, there are many uh, 
uh, environmental and uh, operating conditions that affect very strongly the, uh, the degradation rate of the battery and the battery engineer needs to uh, take care of them because the battery evolves in time. It, it's, it would be the equivalent, think of, think of, of, of it in these terms. If uh, for an electric vehicle, the conventional vehicle equivalent would be that the fuel tank gets smaller over time, right? So that, that is uh, what is called in new battery technology capacity fade, which means that the capacity because of some um, electrochemical phenomena that happen inside the, the battery cell, the capacity gets uh, lower and lower over time, right? And that's extremely important for OEMs because they, they need to um, uh, uh, guarantee that their, their vehicle, in the case of, uh, of, uh, of a car manufacturer, is going to have the range that is specified for, uh, for let's say, eight years or, or so. so all of these very important uh, physical dependencies uh, can be taken care of by an analogy called the equivalent circuit. For all of us who are not electrochemists, um, I myself, I'm a mechanical engineer, right? If, if you're an electrical engineer, the, the same thing applies. Uh, it is easier to think of a battery in terms of this uh, electrothermal analogy. That is to say, a simpler representation of the behavior of the system, right, that contemplates its electrical and thermal uh, behavior, right, but that allows me to work without having to worry about the, the um, uh, chemical level or microscopic level of the, of the electrodes, right. So this is uh, the, the approach that we are going to take to model the battery cells. So here are the four main topics that we are going to be talking about today. And by the way, something that I also uh, forgot to say is that you are more than welcome to write questions in the chat or in the Q&A uh, panel along the way. And I will be trying to monitor the, the questions uh, while I'm doing the, the presentation. So feel free to Feel free to write your questions as um, as you see fit. So we're we're going to present an example of a battery pack simulation in Simulink, right? Uh, I'm going to do a, a brief introduction to what MATLAB and Simulink are based on the responses that I got from the poll. Many of you have um, don't have a, um, a background in MATLAB and Simulink, but that's okay. I'll I'll uh, start from the from the beginning. The second thing that we are going to, to do is uh, give an example of how we can put together a model of a single cell based on some characterization experiments that I may have from my lab or from my battery supplier. The third thing is state estimation, right? So um, the, uh, the estimation of the state of uh, charge and the state of health are uh, very uh, challenging uh, tasks that the battery management system needs to take care of. And we can make use of modeling and simulation to create algorithms for, for those. And uh, time permitting, hopefully I'll ha have time to, to present the, the last example. I will show you a simulation of uh, aging phenomena in, um, in, uh, uh, in battery systems. So, Let's um, let's go to MATLAB for a second. And in case you've never seen MATLAB before, this is the MATLAB environment. MATLAB is a calculation environment for the development of uh, algorithms, data analysis, statistics, control design, and so on. And uh, the, the the main goal of uh, of MATLAB is to provide the scientist or engineer who not necessarily have a mathematics or a, or a um, computer science or or programming background with tools that allow them to do their engineering work and design without having to worry too much about you know coding. 
So what do I what, what do I mean with that? Well, let's say let's say for a, a very very simple example. Let's say I have a matrix, a ten by ten mat matrix like like that, right? And what I want to do is replace the the, the elements of that matrix that um, that satisfy a certain condition. Let's say I want to replace all of the, 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 the numbers there that are greater than 50 by a zero, right? What, what would that entail if I am working with a, a tool like a Fortran or C? Well, in, in, in low level uh, programming languages, I would have to go, uh, I will have to use two for loops, one sweeping in columns, the other sweeping in rows, and then an if statement asking whether the the element is or is not greater than 50 and then do the assignment. What would that um, look like in MATLAB? I can say for all the elements in A that are greater than 50, assign a zero. So doing that in MATLAB takes a few keystrokes uh, replacing the you know ten or twelve uh, lines of code that uh, that uh, would have taken in uh, in um, a tool like um, like Fortran or like a language of uh, like Fortran or C. So that is the that is the goal. I, I I want I want to be able to do engineering or science work without having to know too much about uh, coding or um, yeah program development. How about Simulink? The, the model that I'm going to share with you is, uh, uh, most of them are Simulink, uh, Simulink models. So Simulink is a um, uh, graphical environment that works on top of MATLAB that allows me to develop models of uh, dynamic systems, right? So a, a, uh, w w when, I, uh, when I say it's a graphical environment, I mean this. This is a blank simulating model onto which I am going to bring elements from a, uh, a library, right? Uh, and uh, by bringing elements from this library, I can put together the way in which a, um, a, a, a dynamic system behaves. So for example, if I am using um, if I'm doing control design, I can uh, drop a transfer function in there and say, well, uh, what would happen if I excite this transfer function with a unit step at time equals zero, right? And then I can hook a scope onto the output in there, open the scope and um, once I've done my model, I can proceed with the simulation, right? When I push play in there, what should happen is I will see the, the, the dynamic response of a system, in this case, a first order uh, transfer function or a system represented by this transfer function that of course can be uh, made much more uh, complex if I wanted to, for example, uh, model a second order system, the, uh, the response will be the one that, that we know, right? Um, this is, for example, the, the behavior of a spring mass damper or an RLC circuit, both of them um, being represented with an identical uh, formulation, a second order uh, ODE. So uh, another thing that uh, we will utilize in, uh, in, in modeling battery systems is the following. So uh, when we're doing modeling and simulation with this approach, one of the things that uh, this entails is I have to go through the mathematical formulation, right? I have to uh, analyze my physical system, derive the dynamic equation that, that, that governs the behavior of that system. In this case, the, uh, let's say, x double dot plus x dot plus x equal the exciting force or, or something like that. And then, um, create a simulating model that um, explains or represents the behavior of the system. 
if I want to work on a more intuitive uh, basis, I can also utilize elements of our physical modeling library. Uh, so for example, instead of representing an RLC circuit like that, I can type the sister and there are elements that have directly uh, physical significance, right? So if I want an RLC, I can do this. Connect a voltage source. And a ground, right? So this is also part of the simulated model. It will also represent the behavior of a dynamic system, but I didn't have to worry about the mathematics behind it, right? So the mathematics are taken care of by something called Simscape uh, language, which is um, uh, underneath the um, the definition of each of the of the elements. So what does this have to do with uh, with batteries? Well, uh, a, a very uh, popular way of representing the behavior of um, of a battery is, as I said before, the equivalent circuit that looks something like this. Where each of the uh, elements that I am um, including in the in the model represent different um, electrochemical phenomena inside the cell. So for example, this resistance uh, is part of the internal resistance of the, of the battery cell, the one mainly associated with the separator. That is to say, the one uh, through which the lithium ions need to go from cathode to anode and, and vice versa. This one here is an RC element that gives the um, the battery cell, its dynamic behavior, everything associated with diffusional phenomena. This one here will give me the open circuit potential or voltage or OCV, which is the voltage that I observe when no current is flowing through. And that, uh, that, that has a profile dependent on the state of charge that is uh, dependent on the, the, electrochem the electrochemical type of, of cell. Right. Um, you may have heard if you've done any work with uh, with batteries. There's um, acronyms that denote the, the 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 type of materials that are inside. For example, NMC means um, NMC means uh, nickel manganese cobalt, um, LFP lithium iron phosphate, and and so on. And uh, each of them have a a unique uh, open circuit voltage as a function of SOC uh, signature. Right? So we are going to be doing things using this electrothermal analogy for the for the cell. So I'm going to close this out, I'm not need this anymore, and then go to the to the simulating model of my um, of my first uh, battery pack. So what am I doing here? Well, this is a simulating model that has uh, the types of components that I told you about before, like the, the regular simulink signal-based components uh, on the left-hand side and the physical components on the, on the right-hand side. So there is a current source in here and a voltage sensor in here and a simple battery pack inside this subsystem here. If I go inside this subsystem, what you will see is a, uh, an architecture that in battery technology we called 3S1P, three series, one parallel, right? So three lithium ion unit cells connected in series, right? And um, here's uh, another, another thing that we hadn't um, mentioned before. The components of the, um, 
of the library for for physical system uh, modeling are uh, color coded, right? So for example, in this case, we have two uh, colors in here, the blue and the orange. The blue is associated with everything electrical and the orange is associated with everything thermal, right? So the unit cell is this one and this one and this one that we can barely see, right? And uh, immediately we can see that they are connected electrically in series, right? So plus minus, plus minus, plus, right? And also there is a thermal port sticking out from the, uh, the unit cells. And what, what that um, signifies is the thermal behavior <clears throat> of the cell. So there is a thermal mass that is going to evolve thermally given its um, specific heat and the internal resistance and the current flowing through it, right? So when I use a battery cell, because it has some internal resistance inside, the, the current flowing through that internal resistance is going to create um, a temperature buildup by Joule effect. So basically I, I square R type of, um, of uh, heating. So what, what this uh, type of connection uh, means in this case is that cell number one and cell number two exchange heat by convection, meaning that there, this represents two cells that are next to one another and not touching each other, right? So the heat generated by each, each one is transferred to the surroundings, right? Via uh, convection, right? So one thing that's, that happens here is that, uh, okay, this is uh, electrically connected in series, but also there's, a, there's something um, asymmetrical with respect to the, the thermal connection. If you, if you take a look at the bottom side, this block here, insulation, means that cell number three is actually not able to dissipate heat to the environment, right? So what the what this would represent is cell number one, cell number two, cell number three. There is insulation on one side, and cell number three, uh, sorry, cell number cell number one, right, is actually able to uh, um, get rid of the uh, of the heat by convecting convecting to the atmosphere. So on the, on the top in here, this thermal node is connected to the ambient temperature by this convection uh, term in here, right? So this is a, a particularly bad design because this asymmetry means that the thermal evolution of the cells is going to be non-uniform. And that, as we will see in a second, is, is a problem. So speaking of the the, um, the the simulation itself, what am I what am I doing with this with this battery um, battery pack? So what I'm doing is is the following: this um, block here or set of of blocks. What what it's doing is it is saying, well, okay, uh, I want to cycle this battery cell. I want to charge and discharge the the cell uh, in an alternating way. When I charge. I do it with um, with a technique called CCCV, which means constant current, constant voltage. What that means, and that that's one of the most popular ways of of, um, of charging a, a lithium ion battery, is what that means is the following. So this is voltage, and this is this is current, right? So I charge at constant current until the voltage reach, reaches a certain level, and then I control the voltage so that by uh, like a, a few minutes later, the current is almost equal to zero when the cell is fully charged. That has a very important uh, advantage, which is the fact that because I can, I, I have to avoid overcharging a battery cell at, at all 
at all uh, costs because overcharging a lithium ion cell can become very, very, it's, it's actually very dangerous. What I can do with, uh, with this type of, of charging is charge fast at the beginning and then start char charging slowly at the, at the end. So that's the charging. The discharging is much simpler. It's just constant current discharge. So I'm, I'm charging and discharging and the, the, the switch from charge and discharge is very, very simple. It charges when the state of charge, uh, the, the maximum state of charge of the, of the pack is uh, 99% and it starts the, the, the charging when the, um, when the minimum state, state of charge is uh, 30%. So the result of that is what we are seeing on this scope here. So this is the SOC, the number between zero and one that I was referring to at the at the beginning. So so important to to determine, right? So it's it's going up and down because I am charging and discharging. But there's another thing if you if you pay attention to to this that the the, the module starts um, fairly low in, in state of charge, close to, to 20%. But also, if you if you take a look, a close uh, look at the, the states of charge here, they are also different. So what, what this means is that the SOCs are out of balance, right? So balancing or, or imbalance is the state by which the, the, the individual SOCs of a series connection start to di diverge from one another and that's that's not good because if i if i let that go for a while what happens is that i will end up not being able to utilize the entire um the, the maximum amount of energy of the battery pack because what happens is that when i have a um three cells that are let's let's try to make a, a quick drawing so these are the socs of several cells if I have three cells that are uh, at different SOCs, I can only charge all of them until the, the one that is at the top reaches the maximum SOC value. And then I, I need to start discharging, which means that cells, in this case, cells number two and three are going to, to remain under underutilized. So it is very important that from time to time, the battery engineer uh, balances the, 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 the battery pack. And that is what is happening here. If you, if you see the, the traces of the individual states of charge, you will see that they slowly approach one another and we were all uh, almost done uh, around here. So how are we doing that? Well, we are doing that with this balancing circuit. So on the on to the, to the right of the of the battery pack, there is this this circuitry, right? This is the balancing circuitry, and, and it has basically two things. One is the uh, bleed resistor, the other is the uh, MOSFET. So there is a uh, state logic inside of here, also modeled in, in Simulink, that is taking the individual cell voltages, right? And by determining which of them is um, bigger than, than, than the others, it determines which cell I need to slowly and selectively drain so that its state of charge is um, slowly going down with respect of the, to, 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 to the others, so that at the, at the end of that uh, process, the states of charge of the other cells can catch up with, uh, with the state of charge of the cell at the, at the top. This is uh, wasteful because I am throwing away energy because it is a dissipative method, right? I am, I am actually throwing away potentially usable energy in these uh, resistors, but um, it is the, the only way for, for common applications that is uh, cost-effective, right? 
the counterpart would be so and that's why it's called passive balancing because what we're doing is basically we're draining energy from from the cells the alternative to that is called active balancing and it has a much more sophisticated circuitry and what what that entails is the exchange of um um, of charge between, so the, the shuttle of, of charge between one cell and, and the other. So the, the cells that are at the top charge the cell that are, cells that are at the bottom. That is, in theory, a better idea, but it requires so many more uh, electronic components that it is uh, economically um, not feasible unless we are uh, designing something for which the cost is of secondary importance such as a satellite satellite or um or a space spacecraft or, or something of that of that nature so by far um passive balancing the one that we are seeing here is the most the most popular if you uh if you want i can uh, run this again for for you to see the the logic the balancing logic in action it's not um something that I want to, to talk in, in to too much detail, but you can see the the state logic, uh, um, the states that are active being highlighted every time the, the, um, the, the simulation um, makes them active, right? So that what that means is, for example, when this is active or this is active, the, the code that is inside gets executed and that uh, sends the command to these MOSFET gates so that, oops, sorry about that, so that the, um, so that the, the, this part of the circuit uh, becomes conductive and then I, I can achieve the, the balance. So I'm going to play it again without the logic so that it, uh, it plays um, quickly. And the last thing that I am going to show about this simulation is the, the temperature evolution. So, so far we spoke about electrical stuff. Now we're going to talk about temperature. So this is the, is the temperature evolution of the three individual cells, right? As, as I was saying at the beginning, this is a, a battery module that is not very well designed in terms of its thermal behavior because of that asymmetrical nature, right? So what, uh, what uh, we saw by insulating one side of cell number three, the consequence of that is that the temperature of cell number three is on average uh, higher than the temperature of cell number one. Okay, and there's two potential problems with this. One is the maximum temperature, which in this case is not a problem because uh, this this is in, in, in Celsius and this is not a dangerous temperature for a lithium ion cell, right? So no, nothing is going to, to happen. No, there's no, no, no thermal runaway or anything like that that will happen at this, at this uh, temperature. The problem that is that even if that, um, if that um, temperature is not very big, what is a problem is the difference between minimum and maximum. And the reason for that is that the degradation phenomena in common to all electrochemical phenomena or, or most of, of the electrochemical uh, phenomena are what, um, what chemists uh, uh, call thermally activated, which means that the rate at which they proceed is exponentially dependent on temperature. And that means that in this case, that cell number three is going to age quicker than cell number one. So by using this uh, battery pack like this, right, for a, uh, quite a, a number of cycles, a few hundred cycles or, or, or a few months or years of, of utilization, there is going to be a non-uniform loss in capacity of cell of the individual cell. So this is going to be cell number three, this is going to be cell number one. And this is also very bad 
because it exacerbates the tendency for imbalance, right? So it's it's a problem that you know um, um, fit feeds um, back into itself. So this is something that I need to avoid. Uh, and there's a couple of ways to do that. One is doing active cooling. So most of the high power applications are actively cooled, right? So when um, one of the objectives is to well, dissipate the heat from the cells, but also to keep the, um, the cells in the module at more or less the same temperature. Very, very important. And the other, the other way would be to avoid this uh, geometrical uh, asymmetry, right? So um, avoiding one side of the of the battery pack to be insulated and the other exposed to to the air. To the air. Good. So this is a um, battery cell block, right? That that has inside the behavior given that the the equivalent circuit that we were um, referring to before, right? So what uh, what it has is if I open the the help in here, what it has is uh, these components open circuit voltage, the internal resistance, and a few RC components that gives the voltage relaxation uh, behavior, right? So the topology of this, of this equivalent circuit and the values of the parameters inside are unique to the electrochemistry of choice, right? So they are the ones that define that these uh, uh, these cells are of the, let's say, NMC type 31, in this case, 31 amp power, uh, power cell. Uh, in this case, it is a pouch cell manufactured by uh, Kokum. Where are those uh, characteristics? So if, if we take a look at these parameters, they are all um, fields of a structure called battery here, right? So the the index, it makes reference to the fact that this is cell number one, but in this case, all the cells are, are identical. So it doesn't matter which one, which one we, we talk about, but I wanted to, to show you what they, what they look like. So this is the battery, oops, it's in the other monitor. This is the, the battery uh, structure, right? So these are the fields, right? And the, the rows are the cells, but as I said before, they are identical. So what do these parameters look like? Well, let's take a look, for example, at this one here. E sub M stands for electromotive force. So what, what this is, is the open circuit potential. So this guy, right? So what, what, that, uh, what this matrix is giving me is the volts at open circuit for three different temperatures, in this case, 5, 20, and 40 degrees Celsius, at states of charge from 10% to 100%. So instead of having scalars as the parameters inside the equivalent circuit, I have a lookup table or a matrix that gives me the nonlinear dependency of the cell on the operating and environmental conditions. What I was saying at the beginning that was so, so important, right? So if I uh, show you this in graphical form, you uh, may recognize this as the, the typical OCV signature of an NMC cell. Right, so 4.2 down to about 3, 3.4 uh, volts, and not a very significant OCV dependency on temperature. Right, so this is this is SOC, this is temperature. By the way, th these are just ordinal numbers. This, this is 5, 20, and 40 degrees uh, Celsius. But I wanted to show, for example, the the difference between that and internal resistance, right? Internal resistance, as, as we were saying at the beginning, depends quite a bit on temperature. So these are only three points. So it's very difficult to see an exponential even with three points, but um, uh, internal resistance follows what uh, physical chemists called Arrhenius behavior, 
right? So that means that the log of the internal resistance plotted as a function of one over the absolute temperature is a straight line, which is another way of saying it is exponential with, uh, with temperature. And not a very significant dependency on, on state of charge until when the cell is almost empty that the state of charge suddenly increases. So this is a, a, another typical observation, right? So the internal resistance as a function of state of charge typically looks like this. It may look something like that, or in some cases it's, it has sort of kind of like a smiley face type of, of profile. So at close to zero, close to empty and close to fully charged, the internal resistance is, is high. So because this is such an important parameter because it defines the cell as the, of, a, of a certain nature, I want to be able to determine the value of these parameters. So how do I, how do I determine these parameters, right? So that's, is, that's the subject of my second example. <clears throat> to take a look at the chat window and see if there are any questions about this first. There's one question uh, that says, is capacity fate similar to a full capacity charge? I don't, I don't, I never uh, heard that term. So maybe, um, I will get back to the, the person who uh, asked that question to, for, for clarification. Um, in, there's another question about um, determining or measuring uh, SOC. That is something that I am going to, to show in my third example. So that's coming up. Um, there is a question about the difference between the battery block in specialized component SIM power systems uh, with respect to, to this one here. Um, so basically the, uh, the, the, the difference is that it is the way in which we contemplate the thermal behavior and the SOC dependency, right? So in, in this case, as I just showed the all the parameters can be state of charge uh, dependent. The, um, the SIMScape power system, the, the SIM power system specialized technology uh, equivalent uh, is a little simpler than that. You, you cannot uh, make the parameters dependent on, um, on SOC. In terms of the, um, the thermal behavior, uh, it is, so in general, I would recommend the specialized technology for models that are uh, purely electrical and the SIMScape components, the one that I am talking about now for uh, models that have other uh, phenomena like thermal phenomena. Uh, right, and there's another question uh, that says, um, uh, temperature evolution considerations of the balancing circuit. And that is a very important point. Uh, the balancing current needs to be low enough that it doesn't overheat the, the, um, the, the, the circuit board onto which it is uh, printed because it is typically uh, uh, an IC. So um, um, the balancing resistors are of the order of 20 to 40 ohms, depending on the, on the size of the, of the battery cell. And that is so that the balancing current is kept within the couple of um, milliamps uh, maximum so that the, 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 the circuit board doesn't, doesn't overheat. Thank you very much for the, the very good questions. Good, so now we want to determine the
we some, sometimes uh, call it parameter estimation. What does that entail? Well, the first thing that I need to have is a uh, an experiment done on my uh, on my my system, my battery cell. This is uh, an example of one such experiment. This is an isothermal, i.e., controlled temperature, right? Uh, pulsed discharge experiment. So by injecting a train of discharge pulses to a an initially fully charged cell, I partially drain it all the way down until I cannot uh, discharge it anymore, right? Now, the uh, at each each time there is current flowing out of the cell, there is a voltage drop because of the internal resistance. And then there's a voltage recovery that depends on time that I can observe when the current goes back to zero, right? So this type of behavior is the typical dynamic behavior of a, of a battery cell, right? So there's, in this case, we can see uh, a voltage recovery that has two main um, components. One component that is instantaneous with, with time and another one that is exponential with time, right? So roughly speaking, I am going to be calculating the internal resistance R0 based on this part and the diffusional components with this part. So one or more of these, right? So if you if you think about this as a, as an electrical circuit, the exponential is the response of this kind of components when I um, inject a uh, a current pulse, right, and and let and let go, right. So the discharge of the um, of the capacitor is going to give me this exponential um, uh, shape, right. And the characteristic time of the exponential is given by the value of the resistor times the value of the capacitance. So it's typically we call this tau. And in uh, most cells, what, what this is, is a superposition of several taus, several exponentials of, of different um, uh, characteristic times. So what do I do with this? Well, one thing that I can do is do this, which is something that I did to my experimental cell, do the same thing to a model of the cell, right? So this model is uh, representing that discharge experiment. Uh, remember that the, 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 in the previous model, there were some blue components and there were some orange components. Well, um, the, um, the, the reason why there's no orange anymore in here is that this is an isothermal um, uh, approach, right? So there's no, there's no need for, um, for the, the thermal part. Um, one second. Can you hear me well when one person said that uh, my, my voice is, is, very, uh, is very faint? Uh, let me see if I can fix that. Hopefully, can you hear me well now? Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much for the feedback. Okay, good. So I have an experiment and I have a model, right? I need to parameterize this, this, uh, this component, right? So I can start by defining uh, some initial guesses for those, um, for the parameters of the equivalent circuit, right? And put them, put them in here, right? I define those uh, initial guesses in the, in the MATLAB workspace. So let's say 
let's start with the open circuit voltage equal to 3.8 volts at all SOCs, right? The, the temperature is no longer here because this is uh, isothermal, right? I need to do, I need to repeat what I am going to, to do. Um, for every temperature that's for, for which I, I care about, right? But SOC is not is not the same because the SOC is not something that I can control independently, right? So the, the parameter needs to be a, a vector that is a function of SOC and the, 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 the system is going to be identifying each uh, component of this vector depending on the state of charge change during the simulation. So, if I if I run the model, right, um, you will see that when I compare experiment with simulation before doing the, um, the 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 calculation of the parameters, the result is not good, right? So this is the, the blue is the experiment, the orange is the simulation, and they don't match because the um, the the parameters are incorrect. So parameter estimation is about using an optimization routine to, sorry, no, I didn't want to do that. Using an optimization, optimization routine to minimize the difference between where I am and where I want to be, right? So the optimizer in MATLAB is going to try to change the values of the parameters of the equivalent circuit so that this simulated voltage looks more like my experimental voltage. So that's that's called parameter estimation. And it's basically a, a technique to combine simulation and optimization. So let me let me quickly show you how to how to do that. Okay. So here, I indicated to this uh, graphical user interface, what are mm, the parameters that I want to estimate? Keep in mind, again, that each of these parameters is a 10 element vector, okay? It's not four parameters, but 40 parameters, right? And then which experiment I am going to be um, using. So when I go ahead and, uh, and, and start the calculation, what Simulink is going to do is this. It will say, well, okay, what do I have to, to, to work with? I have this equivalent circuit, right, that you propose. In this case, I started with saying, let's start simple with a single time constant equivalent circuit, right? And then I have some initial guesses for the parameters of that equivalent circuit, right? And then the optimizer is going to run the model to simulate the, 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 the characterization, characterization experiment over and over and over and over. So you, you can see this going on without me doing anything, right? I'm not touching the computer right now. The, the model simulates and every time the model um, runs and, and, and stops, Simulink uh, or, or actually the, the MATLAB's optimization functions say, well, how far am I from where I want to be, right? So at the beginning, I will be uh, pretty far. So you can see here that some parts of the, of, of the orange line are, are moving a little bit, but we are still very far from where we, we actually want to be. So as long as I am far from where I want to be, the parameters of the equivalent circuit are slightly perturbed. They are changed a little bit. And then the optimizer says, well, did that perturbation make things better or worse? And uh, it keeps asking itself the, the, the same question and it keeps going in the direction of the of the um, parameter variation that actually improves the the fitting this is going to um, 
to take maybe six or seven minutes. So I'm not going to, to wait for, for it to, to, to finish, but maybe, maybe the first, um, maybe the first iteration we can, we can let go. So, um, once, so again, I am doing this with a set with, with a, with an experimental measurement and with a set of initial guesses as my parameters, right? And also I proposed a certain equivalent circuit architecture. In this case, uh, the, a single equivalent, a single time constant equivalent circuit that may or may not work. And um, one, one reason for, for that, <laughs> excuse me, uh, not to work is, for example, if, if you take a look at, uh, if you take a close look at the, at this relaxation and you compare it with this relaxation, you will notice that there's a difference between the two, right? And, and uh, what, um, what actually is happening here is that the dynamic response of this equivalent circuit is actually a little more complicated than a single time constant. So, uh, here's the, the, the first uh, iteration uh, finished. You, you can see that it improved the, the, the fit um, quite a bit, but we're, we're not there yet. So now that that uh, happened, I'm going to interrupt this and I am going to manually load the final parameter values for the, the single time, time constant uh, case. So you can see here, I should have shown this at the at the beginning, but but this is a single time constant equivalent circuit, right? So with this shortcut, I am going to load the final values, give it a go again, and you will see that if I had waited enough time, this would have been where the optimization ends. And and take a look at this, right? The the problematic relaxation was not captured well with a single equivalent circuit model. And, and the reason for that, as we said a moment ago, is that the experimental voltage relaxation is actually a three time constant voltage relaxation. And I, there's no way that I can mathematically fit the three, a three time constant um, uh, exponential function with a single time constant um, a fitting function, right? So single time constant, because if the only thing that I have in my equivalent circuit is one of this and one of this, the only time constant is R1 C1, right? So there's no way I can do this better. So what I can do is say, well, okay, let's, let's change this to a three time constant problem, right? So I did that with a, with a shortcut, but if I go back to here, you will see that this uh, this this block now has three equivalent or um, yeah three RC components therefore three time constants and if I load the final values of the three time constants and go ahead and, and rerun the the simulation it um, the the fit is better I mean it's it's not perfect but it is significantly better than it was before right so sometimes maybe i can i can do a little better uh, working here but what i what i mean with this is that because parameter estimation is mathematically an inverse problem or or, or a calibration problem sometimes well mathematically it doesn't have a unique solution right so i may have to try different different equivalent circuits different sets of initial guesses for the parameters and and so on, right? So it's a it's a it's a complex problem, and as 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 usual, it demands a little experience. So you 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 basically get better as 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 time time goes by. Um, so if um, in the future you feel yourself in the need to do something like like this, please let us know if you need uh, any help, and we'll be very happy to take a look at your at your project and, and your, your battery cell data and, and we might be able to, to, to give you some advice. So once this is done for all of the temperatures that I care about, so at the end of the day, what I will be doing is populating 
you know, column by column, I will be populating my battery um, lookup tables, right? So what I just did is it's one column, actually the, this one here, the 20 degrees uh, Celsius column of the, of the battery cell, right? So it will, it will demand two more in order to do this, this entire, entire um, lookup table. So once once I've got that, then I am ready to go and and use the a um, a a block like I like I showed at the at the beginning in the in the first example. Let's see if there is any question about this. Okay, no questions. Um, th this is something that you, if if you have some thoughts later on, um, and and also as I said before, I, I will leave all of the examples behind, right? So if you want to play around with them and ask me questions later on your own time, I'll be more than happy to to get back to you by by email or or with a phone call. Great. So topic number three: What else can we do to um, design battery systems once I have my battery cell correctly parameterized. So as I promised at the beginning and, and one, uh, one of the uh, members of the audience actually asked me the, the question, how do I estimate state of charge? Okay, so state of charge. So theoretically, it would be okay to just integrate the current that flows in and out of the cell, right? The integral of the current, if I integrate amps, I get amps per second or amp hours, which is basically a, a, a measure of the charge inside the cell. And if I divide that integral by the total capacity, I get the state of charge, right? So in theory, the only thing that I need is to integrate the current. The problem is that if I only do that, the tiny errors that are a result of uh, inaccuracies in the way in which I um, measure the current, right? So typically we'll, we, we measure the current um, across a, uh, a calibrated uh, shunt, right? Um, errors will accumulate over time, right? So if I don't do something else, the accuracy of my SOC is going to go worse and worse and worse and worse, and then all of a sudden there's, it is completely useless, right? So um, a typical way of correcting for, for that, um, for that uh, problem, for, to, to compensate for that inaccuracy is, to correct by voltage. One way to do that is to say, well, if, if I read a voltage that is low enough that I can say, okay, this is almost the definition of SOC equals zero. So I will reset my counter and I will say the SOC is equal to zero now. The same thing at the, um, at the, um, at the top, right? So if, if SOC is equal to, if the voltage is high enough, the is the SOCA can say it is equal to one. So that's that's one way of, of doing that. The issue with doing that is that it is not applicable to hybrid systems where the SOC always hovers around 50% SOC, right? So there's no there's no chance to, to do that, that reset. So the the state of the art technique to, to do this is using an observer and the Kalman filter or in this case, the extended or the unscented Kalman filter are uh, good solutions for that. So what, what is a Kalman filter? A Kalman filter is a, um, an algorithm that some controllers have that observes what comes in and out of my system in this case, my system is my battery. And that also has a model of that system inside, right? So 
with the information of the current coming into the real cell. So this is this is my real cell. Sorry about my sloppy drawing here, but my Kalman filter is saying, well, okay, these uh, amps are are coming into my cell. So I can, using the model that is inside the common filter, I can calculate an estimated voltage. So typically we call this voltage hat. And if I compare that against the real voltage, right, by trying to make this equal to zero, the Kalman filter can estimate the internal parameters of the dynamic system, right? In this case, the, um, the internal parameter that I care the most about is the, uh, the state of charge. So basically what, uh, and, and you typically don't need uh, different versions of the Kalman filter in one system. This is just an example to compare two different kinds of Kalman filter, Kalman filters, uh, in this case, two uh, nonlinear common filters, the extended and the unscented common filter. So here's what what I'm doing in this in this uh, example. I am uh, charging and discharging my cell. So this is identical to the one that that we saw before, right? The same the same battery cell of the first example, and the common filter is receiving that current voltage and temperature. Um, signals and with a model of the cell that by the way also comes from the same characterization procedure that, that I just uh, mentioned right so these lookup tables that are inside the common filter are the same lookup tables that I determined using the parameter estimation routine right the common filter is um, is going to estimate the state of charge of the cell right the difference between unscented and an extended common filter is beyond the, the, the scope of, of this um, of this discussion, but this, it's two different flavors of nonlinear uh, common filters. And when this uh, runs, um, you will see that I initialized the common filter uh, SOC 10% uh, away from the real SOC. I think the real SOC is 50% and I said, I told the common filter that it was 60, yeah. So the real SOC is the is the, the red curve and the um, the other uh, the other two are, are the, uh, the common filter guesses, right? So I start 10% off and it takes about one hour, so this is, 10 to the fourth, right? So 0 0.36 is one hour. It takes about one hour of simulated time to um, to converge to the real to the real value, right? So and uh, it, they, they, both of them uh, react dynamically a little a little different differently, but more or less uh, uh, reach the, the the convergence at the same time. The Unscented common filter is more computationally expensive than the extended common filter, so I recommend um, you you use this one here um, unless you you really have to. Um, there is a um, actually a couple of questions. Give me one second. Oh, so question number one is about um, is about the the previous example. Uh, it says, how does the uh, optimization run? Let's say the equivalent circuit uh, contains one series resistor, and one RC pair. Does the algorithm adjust all of them in parallel or one by one? So they um, they are being um, uh, perturbed all si simultaneously in 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 each uh, iteration, right? And that's why. The um, the computation can be paralyzed because the uh, the the perturbation is done independently in one versus the other. So all of the parameters are being uh, estimated at the at the same time. However, if you have a reason not to, if you if you want to, you know, estimate uh, one first and uh, another later, there's an option to to do that as well. Um, and adding to the previous question, have to give the underlying. Okay, so 
I don't. So the, the question is, do you have to give the underlying ECM uh, to the optimization engine? Actually, no, because the um, the optimization uh, function, the the uh, the objective function from the optimization uh, is a result of the simulation. So um, the the um, the I. I Simulink and MATLAB are going to take care of that without me having to to uh, intervene in there. Um, my colleagues from TechSource are asking me about uh, a time check. So we have a uh, ten thirty uh, finish time. So I am I am almost almost done, um, and uh, I need to you know fire up the the second uh, poll. So I am going to do that right now and maybe. Uh, in the few minutes that are left, perhaps uh, you can um, uh, ask me any any other uh, question that uh, that come to mind. Uh, I am uh, I had to leave aside the the SOH uh, estimation problem. I can um, yeah. So yeah, and the 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 one with uh, with degradation because um, I didn't have time. With the um, with all the the very good questions that were asked, but that's something that I can always you know come back to on a one on one um, basis if you if you uh, want me to. And uh, as a matter of fact, the um, the uh, the examples that contemplate those things, I will also share uh, them with uh, with you all so that you you have them, and I can um, separately. Uh, record a presentation of those uh, of, of those examples that I didn't have time to to do today in this an hour and a half, and so that you have the, an explanation along with uh, with the example. So we can we can do it like that if if you if you if you're okay with that. So let me. Okay, great. So uh, yes, absolutely. The the, the uh, there's a question about um, the examples for the for the aging. Those are going to be included in the follow up uh, materials. But as I said before, if you want to have a a conversation, a separate conversation about about those, uh, please let me know via my colleagues at uh, at TechSource, and I'll, I'll make sure that uh, we can we can do that or. Uh, if we if we do uh, an event like this one here in the future, we can also make that uh, part of the of the agenda. But I um, I, I will definitely um, I am I am uh, perfectly fine with uh, recording them separately. I think I lost the chat. Let me see what happened. Okay. Um, while you uh, fill out the the second poll, uh, there's another question that says, "How do you calculate the real SOC?" Ah, yeah, that's a very good question. Well, I in general I can't. the The reason I can do that in my example is that this is a simulation, so I have access to the simulated current, and I can integrate it with as much accuracy as I as I want. Of course, that is not um, that is not possible in um, in um, in real life, right? That's uh, that, that's why we need sophisticated algorithms to uh, to to estimate the SOC, the SOC. So the the goal of this example was to say this algorithm is going to um, converge in this much time. That's that's basically the the, the reason for that. Okay, so um, there are oh, okay, yeah. There's a question about uh, reference um, material publications. I can definitely uh, share uh, some of that as well for sure. Um, I will include that in the follow-up material. 
So for my colleagues of uh, TechSource, I am ready to show the, um, the final slide. So please go ahead and take over the, uh, the microphone when, when you're ready. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Javier, for the insightful presentation and sharing of his expertise and experience. So do you want to hear more interesting topics? Before we open the Q&A session, I would like to remind everyone to uh, give us the variable feedback in the poll, or you can also scan the QR code to fill out a short survey. So the Javier, would you share the slides? Absolutely, my, my own slides, uh, yeah, they, they can definitely be, be shared, but uh, I think the most important part is the is the demos, right? I my my slides were were very 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 simple. But I can definitely share if if that is if that is of interest. Uh, okay, sure. So I just want to bring uh, your attention to uh, to stay tuned with us to look out for more upcoming events and attend our public or customized training by our professional trainers. You can also always follow our LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube channel. We also work with MaxWorks to offer consultancy service to help you accelerate your projects. We have MaxWorks industry managers based in Singapore, like uh, Dr. Simon Ng, Electronics and Semiconductor Industry Managers, who is also here today. Yes, hello everyone, it's Simon here. Uh, thank you for joining. And uh, I think there's uh, questions for uh, Happier uh, in, the, uh, yeah, in the chat. Oh, let me see. Hi, hi Happier, yep. Okay, so, um, one question says, the example of the EKF and UKF signaling blocks, can we convert to code using code generation? Yeah, very good question. Yes, the answer is yes. Since both the EKF and the UKF blocks belong in the simulating library, they generate um, uh, embeddable code. So you can uh, basically right click on the block and generate uh, C code um, having previously configured the model for the type of um, microcontroller that so that you want to 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 target so that's that's um, uh, possible um, let me see the accuracy of the algorithm depends upon real-time measurements of voltage and current accuracy of UR measurement circuits decide your output in overall estimation of SOC still challenging in real field. Yeah, I um, I, I agree with the comment. I, I, I don't think it is um, um, a question, but, but yeah. So another thing uh, to take into consideration when when we measure, when we utilize current and, and, and voltage measurements that need to be simultaneous um, is the, um, the, um, the, 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 the limitations of the way in which we collect the data. So for example, in automotive uh, systems, um, if we are, um, um, let me see, what, what is the, the name of that? Um, of that protocol that the BNT toolbox uses. Uh, Simon, do you remember? I can't. Uh, uh, can can so the, when 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 we are measuring this with with can, we are limited to the to the the frequencies uh, that uh, that that is is providing us right. So if we expect a uh, a current and a voltage measurement to line up, we need to be mindful of the fact that in a real uh, application, they may not be exactly simultaneously. Um, 
do you have another question says, uh, do you have a, a temperature model where we can predict the battery runtime in the context of the battery thermally cut off? Yes, I, I do. I do have a, that model. I will include a link to actually that that model is available on uh, our, our MATLAB central repository. So I am going to uh, to include that as a link in the follow up material. So that's part of the uh, BMS. Um, a demo that that we have that I didn't present today, but it does have uh, a provision for uh, temperature limits, both for high temperature and for low temperature. How about uh, RUL? I think they are. Um, Mr. Schwa is re referring to remaining useful life model for battery, taking into consideration the effect of temperature and SOC. Uh, we are working on that actually. Um, we have a toolbox, a uh, relatively new toolbox. It's called um, Predictive Maintenance Toolbox. And I am working with the development team for that toolbox um, that, uh, in order to include a battery example as a, as a shipping um, demo. So that's, that's coming up hopefully. Another question says, is there a way to calculate the time taken to charge a battery based on charging power? As just using the battery capacity and divide by charging power is inaccurate. Well, so if we, um, if we do that in simulation, we can uh, decide on a charging protocol, uh, obey the maximum temperature limits, right? So that will include um, power or current uh, G rating for cases where I am utilizing the, the battery pack at very, very high temperatures. And then the, um, the total time will be given by the, by the simulation. I don't think you can do that without running the simulation, but in most cases, the simulation is fast enough that, um, that you'll be able to, to, to do it, um, you know, in, a, in an effective way. Thank you for the question. Uh, another question says, do you have a model to remain run remaining runtime? The ba battery allows us to discharge. Yep, yeah. so same same thing, charge and discharge. As a matter of fact, the, um, the model that, the BMS demo that I was referring to for two questions ago, that can be used for, for this, this purpose. And uh, yes, so the question is, can I have a, the slides for this presentation? Certainly, uh, as a follow-up material, I will send all the slides and all the examples, no problem. Okay, I think that those are, those are all the questions. I am going to display my, um, my email address so that you have it in case you want to Contact me. Uh, but uh, but yeah, you can also you can always contact my colleagues at uh, uh, TechSource, and they can forward your your questions to to me at any time. All right. Um, Simon or Faye, any, or Dr. Singh, any, any final thoughts or, or comments on your side? Well, we have received very good questions today. So if any one of you have more questions, uh, please feel free to ask now, or we can, you can always uh, follow up with us to send in more questions. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, everybody. It's been a great pleasure for, for all of us to share uh, this time with you. And I certainly look forward to continuing the discussion with, um, with, with all of you individually. Thank you very much and have a good, uh, have a good rest of the week and weekend. Thank you very much for everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Faye. Thank you, Javier. Thank you. It's okay for joining us today.